we've been looking at George Whitfield. We've read one of his sermons. Uh, here's a quotation. I'm not sure if we got to yesterday or not, uh, but certainly is not only relevant to his time, something he struggled with, but I think it's relevant to us today as we've attempted to see how uh, what happened in the first great awakening, uh, especially the needs for it are relative to our needs today, uh, and what happened in the awakening are are things that we ought to be praying that God would do once again today. Uh, this is also something that is applicable to our churches today. Uh, Whitfield said the sins of the church are far more offensive to God than the sins of the nation. We, we have a tendency to look at how our country has gone downhill, and we can see that. Uh, we can see that in our government, we can see that in the media, but are we willing to look at our churches and say, have our, have our churches gone down? Are our churches as strong in teaching the Bible as they have been in the past? Uh, are we centered around Christ and His Word as much as before? So, uh, something for us all to uh, consider as we go on to. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I believe I did mention yesterday, that there was a split within the uh, Presbyterian Church, just like there had been in the Congregational Church. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Congregational Church, as there had been in the Presbyterian Church, uh, between the old life and new life. Uh, the old life, old, in both those contexts, uh, refers to uh, those that were against the awakening, against revival, that there was too much emotional excess. Uh, they didn't like being attacked as pastors for not being followers of Christ, uh, they, they wanted to main, be able to maintain what they have been doing. Uh, the new lights were those that were in favor of revival, uh, who really wanted God's work in their congregation. So uh, Edwards addressed that, and he gave a definitive defense of what was happening in the awakening. So I want you to be exposed to that, because I think, once again, we can use what, what Edwards points out as uh, an example for us today as well. All right, so let's go through them as Edward gave. First of all, and I'm giving you a summary of what he said. Uh, you, you can get his uh, work. You, you've read a little bit about it in the article that you read already, the article that he wrote on uh, the defense of the awakening. Uh, first of all, revival should not be judged by its promoters, but by its effects. In other words, don't judge whether a revival is occurring by those that are preaching, those that are promoting it. Judge it by the effects. What are our lives being changed? Arguing for 1 John 4, Edwards presented a positive statement of valid criteria. And here are the distinguishing marks for a, a revival from God. First of all, there should be a greater esteem for Jesus. When you uh, look at any revival that takes place, and there have been several claims in the last 20 years of revivals here and there, uh, has there been, as a result of that, a greater esteem for Jesus? And I, I've seen some places where there seem to be a greater esteem for uh, miracles or for uh, different stupendous things are happening, but not necessarily uh, for Jesus, not a love for him. Uh, is, there, is there an operation against the interest of Satan? Uh, that should characterize a true revival. That is an operation against the interest of Satan. Uh, this is a key. A greater regard for Scripture. Are people drawn into God's Word as a result of this revival? Are more people studying God's Word? Are more people reading God's Word? Is there an emphasis on God's word in the preaching? Next, is there leading persons to truth, convincing them of those things that are true? Is there an emphasis on truth? What is the truth of God's word? You know, a lot of times I hear uh, preachers talking about all kinds of things, but they never get to what's the truth. You know, they're telling good stories and it's entertaining, but what's the truth? We need to know what the truth is. And then a spirit of love operating to God and man. Edwards pointed out that if a true revival takes place, if people are really changed, they're going to have love to God 
the law of the supporter of fellow man. Notice he didn't say they will love themselves. Uh, that's a, a humanistic idea that has infiltrated into the church, and I, I shouldn't take time to talk about it, so I'll just mention it just for your thinking. The Bible never tells us to love ourselves, does it? Why? Because it's assumed that we do. And you say, oh, but people have low self-esteem. Well, why do they, they have low self-esteem? Because they love themselves so much they don't like what's going on in their lives. Love for self is not something that results from awakening. A love for God and a love for other people is what results. All right. Any comments or questions about what he said so far about judging a revival by its effects? Those are some pretty good guidelines. And notice he gets them straight from Scripture, from 1 John. All right. Next, he, he did denounce some features of the awakening. He said it's not, you know, he's not all in saying, oh, you know, I love everything that, that happened. Uh, he does point out some negatives. The first is the pride of some as a major cause of error as evidenced in the vindictive speeches. Did you know the word vindictive? Anybody? Vindictive means that you are uh, going after somebody. You, know, you don't like what they said about you, and so now you're going back at them. It's the opposite of what we're just talking about in Bible class, about being merciful, right? So there were some people that were preaching that when they got opposition, they attacked back. We see that a lot in the political realm. Just had an election yesterday, so we saw a lot of that in the political ads, if you watch TV at all. You saw one candidate attacking uh, another candidate, and then this candidate attacks back at that candidate. And I kept thinking, but I have no idea what you believe. I have no idea what you think about them, because all you're doing is attacking one another. Don't really care so much about that, because I don't even know if it's true. Tell me what you would do. But anyway, that's a little bit off the, off the topic, but uh, this was happening among the preachers, that some of them uh, became so proud that they couldn't take any criticism, so they attacked. In their speeches. There are some theological errors that arose during the awakening, such as immediate revelation. In other words, there were some preachers, like Davenport was doing, was claiming to have that God was speaking directly to them when they were speaking, and so they're just relaying the message of God, you know, like Old Testament prophets. Um, special prayers, uh, and I'm not sure what he meant by that. Uh, and then thirdly, a lack of stress on education. Uh, that just anybody could go and, uh, and pastor a church without education. Now, I'm not, and I, and I wouldn't necessarily agree with that totally. I think there have been people that have been good leaders uh, and educated themselves. Uh, but I have seen that uh, in uh, a number of different places where um, people maybe are not as good a teachers of God's Word because they haven't been educated, uh, because they haven't uh, received training. So they uh, say things that um, may not be accurate. So education is important. It's not a total preventative because there are people who are educated that are idiots too. In that case, you're just an educated idiot. But uh, education is important. So I encourage you to get education no matter what you're going to do. Uh, and then lastly, he denounced the uh, counterfeit spiritual experiences. Uh, there was something ha happening among some of the groups, uh, some of the preachers, uh, and that is that they were doing things in order to bring about emotional experiences. Now, I, I told you that when Edwards spoke, especially when he was preaching that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Anger God, that people were reacting emotionally. They were falling off of his benches and crying out because it had impacted him so greatly. And Edward's response was, get control of yourselves, right? But there were other preachers who spoke in such a way as to encourage that kind of activity because they thought that by having that activity, that they were thereby validating their preaching, that they were showing that what they were doing was having an effect because people were responding. And some people were doing that intentionally. And Edward's saying, that's counterfeit. Now we're going to see, as we get on to the second Great Awakening, that that is going to occur more 
and more. Uh, Edwards said um, in, the, in the last defense of the awakening, in, which is called a treatise concerning religious affections in 1746, he argued that true religion consists in the affections that are aroused by God. See, and this is the difficult thing sometimes. You know, we may, we may feel an arousal in our spirit. We have to ask ourselves the question, is the way I'm feeling from God, or is it just my own emotions? Or is it some outside force that is, is causing this? And we can't always answer that. Uh, so the only good answer is to uh, compare what I'm experiencing, what I'm thinking, with what it says in God's Word. Uh, Edward said this, The essence of all true religion lies in holy love. And in this divine affection and an habitual disposition to it, and that light which is the foundation of it, and those things which are the fruits of it, consist the whole of religion. You know, do you remember what James said was the identifying feature of true religion? Remember what James said? True religion consists in this. Exactly. Orphans and widows, I think is what he said. Caring for orphans. That's showing the love to other people. And Edward says, foundationally, that is the key ingredient uh, that God has worked. Our people showing the love for others. And we might say that would be mercy. Yeah. Which, which one? About the treatise concerning religious affections. Oh, he argued that true. Sorry, I thought I had that on a slide, and apparently I don't. It was all white. <laughs> You can't read that? No. <laughs> it's there? It's, it's there, but it's white? It's like sort of like really yes. blended. That's on the last line. That's Edward Williams. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you. Uh, rather than yeah. trying to read something. Stuff. There oh, we go. There it is. It's up. Where'd that come from? <laughs> oh, it's gone to us. <laughs> oh, man, there it goes. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. No. I will try again. Here we go. I can't stop it. I'm gonna to have to change that to a different way of uh, it appearing up here. I thought that was just gonna scroll up and stop it. Okay. See, people watching this on YouTube will probably will stop it and look at it, but you guys can't. And I can't. Okay. Um. Okay, now let's try it this way. There. Yeah. And you already had it. <laughs> and you think about uh, Jesus said the same thing too, didn't he? Remember when uh, the rich young ruler came to him? And asked him how to enter the kingdom of God, or, or what, and asked what the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, The greatest commandment is this that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. It's loving God and loving your neighbor. John points out in 1 John that if you say you love God but hate your neighbor, you don't have the love of God. You can't separate them. If you love God, you're going to love your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, that means you don't love God. That's an indication that you don't love God. Okay, do we have it? Yes. After much effort on my part, a little on yours. Anybody doesn't have it yet? Okay, I just want to look at a couple of statements by which we'll uh, uh, we're going to spend some time here. Um, 
Whitfield said, when you hear of a notorious sinner, instead of thinking you do well to be angry, beg of Jesus Christ to convert and make him a monument of his free grace. So that goes along with what we were saying in Bible class too, doesn't it? Instead of thinking of people uh, for what they are as a, a dirty, rotten sinner, someone who does something really bad, uh, think of them with mercy. Uh, and, and that you pray that God would change them as a great monument to his grace. Now, in your notes, I think that you may have a, a, a next uh, point here called the Whitfieldian, Whitfieldian Awakening. And there's a couple points we made there before you, I show you another quote or two from Whitfield. Uh, th this second phase is not limited to a particular geographic area. So uh, previously we've looked at phase one and phase two which are in geographical areas. We're going to look at phase three next. But the Woodfieldian phase covers the whole country, and it covers uh, through chronologically, too. It's, it's not limited to one particular time frame. Uh, it was widespread. Uh, there was a long list of other preachers that emerged that were traveling around as well. Uh, Edwards himself uh, traveled around a little bit, and uh, as, you know, preached his famous sermon sinners in the hands of an angry God at another congregation besides his own in Enfield, Connecticut in July 1741. Uh, here's what I want you to get. The awakening affected colonists across economic lines, sociological lines, occupational lines, geographical lines, that is, both frontier and city, class lines, denominational, and colonial lines. So in other words, there was no part of America that was not affected by Woodfield and the revival that took place through him. It wasn't limited to a certain kind of people or a certain area of people. It was across all different kinds of lines that were there. Whitfield was the golden thread that tied the awakening together throughout the colonies. And in 1743, the revival suddenly declined as opposition to the awakening mounted. Let's go to another quote by Whitfield. To help prevent spiritual pride, let us remember that we did not choose Christ, but were chosen by him. Again, that comes from his Calvinistic perspective, that God has chosen me. And therefore, I can have no pride in the fact that I belong to him. I had nothing to do with it. God chose me in his grace. That brings me to humility before him, rather than pride. Nothing about which to boast. Uh, here's his uh, good friend, Ben Franklin. Uh, uh, interesting friendship between the two of them. Uh, they were on opposite ends of the theological spectrum. Franklin proclaimed a religious creed which consisted primarily of good works. Winfield's last public words, preached within hours of his death, declared this. Works, works. A man gets to heaven by works? I would as soon think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand. Uh, Franklin did have an interesting uh, experience with Winfield. I'm, I'm not sure if it might have been in something that you read. Uh, but one of the things that Winfield did as he was traveling around uh, from place to place, in, in addition to preaching the gospel, he also was trying to collect money for an orphanage in Georgia. And uh, Franklin found that every time he attended one of Whitfield's meetings, he was always giving money, more money than he in intended to give. And so uh, on one occasion, he resolved that he was not going to let Whitfield talk him into giving him all of them, all his money. So he, put, took, he, had, he had money in his pocket. He took a certain amount of money and put it in a pouch and put that. He says, I'm deciding ahead of time that's what I'm giving Whitfield. I'm not giving him any more. And he had more money with him, but that's what he was limiting. But as Whitfield was preaching and as he made his appeal for the uh, orphanage, uh, Franklin found himself uh, digging into his pocket and giving him the rest of the money as well. So uh, Franklin was moved by Whitfield's preaching in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, not to salvation. Uh, Franklin never did come to the Lord. Uh, as uh, he was nearing death, uh, Franklin said, uh, there's no point in taking time to investigate as to whether uh, Christ really is God. I'll find out soon enough. Well, 
you know, after you're after you're dead, it's too late to find out. Uh, Whitfield said this: We are immortal until our work on earth is done. In other words, we live as long as God has uh, work for us to do. I mean, he's decided that we're done. We're done. Uh, this is a picture of the burial place of Whitfield, and I don't remember for sure where it is. I think it might be in Boston. I think that's where he's buried. Although I've never seen it myself. Okay. Hope to someday. Maybe this summer. Any questions about Whitfield? All right, we want to move on now to the southern colonies. So we're talking about Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, primarily. Um, and uh, that's the trail that we'll take. Or it'll start up here in Virginia and move down this direction. Uh, begins in Hanover, Virginia, in that area, among some German pietists and some Scotch-Irish pietists. I remember the pietists were those that emphasized a relationship with Christ, but they de-emphasized what? <coughs> what did they not emphasize? Theology or doctrine, right. Uh, they had access, uh, now these are people that were living in an area that was uh, more frontier, and so they did not have a church and a pastor. They had access to Pilgrim's Progress, so they were reading that together. They had Luther's commentary on Galatians, and they had Whitfield sermons, uh, who Franklin had, which was Franklin had printed. So that's what they had. They didn't have anybody to lead them. They had no church set up. But they started meeting together and reading these items together. Uh, I think it was this group that, as a, a census taker, went out from the, uh, the capital in Virginia in order to assess what churches were out there. Uh, because, you know, there was a state church in Virginia, which is the Anglican Church, so they were trying to find out are there other churches around. And they got to this group of people and asked them, what church, what kind of church are you? They didn't know, because they had not been organized as a church, but they thought about it and decided that since they were reading a commentary by Luther, they must be Lutherans. That's the only idea they had about it. Well, the uh, awakening began then with these people that are simply reading these different items. Uh, William Robinson, who was a New Life pastor, discovered these people and uh, that they were ripe for evangelism. and they're ready to, for someone to preach the word to them. Uh, Samuel Davies also pastored among them until he was called to Princeton College as president. So, among the Presbyterians, we have uh, William Robinson as the main person. And then also Samuel Davies. Now notice it's not Davis, it's Davies. So that's an initial beginning among the Presbyterians. Uh, then we move to the Baptists. In 1775, now notice this is long after the awakening has ended in other parts of the country. And it's when the uh, American War for Independence is starting. So we're <coughs> creeping off up into that era when uh, a guy by the name of Shubal Stearns moved from Sandy Creek, North Carolina to New England. And uh, he became new light in his thinking. Uh, he reported of one meeting in the next year uh, that about 700 attended the meetings that lasted six days. 24 persons, he says, were, quote, received by a satisfactory declaration of grace, and 18 of them were baptized. The power of God was wonderful. Unquote. Now I want you to, to uh, get a flavor for uh, how Stearns preached, maybe a little differently than what we have experienced so far with Edwards and Whitfield. This is what it says about a typical meeting under Stearns. Uh, he would preach a sermon, and at the close of the sermon, the minister would come down from the pulpit, and while singing a suitable hymn, would go around the brethren shaking hands. So there are people are still there, and he's going around shaking their hands. Uh, the hymn being sung, he would then extend an invitation to such persons as felt themselves poor, guilty sinners, and were anxiously inquiring the way of salvation, 
to come forward and kneel near the stand. So he's saying if, if you're if you're concerned about your soul, if you uh, are not sure that you belong to Christ, um, as everybody's leaving, come on up and kneel down up here in the front. Or if they prefer, they can kneel at their seats. Uh, Stearns volunteering to unite with them in prayer for their conversion. He says, I'll come and pray with you for your conversion. After prayer, singing, they sing again, an exhortation. You know, he would exhort them to either continue searching for God or to or to continue on in the faith if they come to faith, um, you know, prolonged according to the circumstances, the congregation would be dismissed to meet again at night for preaching or prayer meeting. They held afternoon or night meetings during the week. In these night meetings, there would occasionally be preaching, but generally they were only for prayer, praise, and exhortation, and direct personal conversation with those who might be concerned after their soul's salvation. So that's how Stern conducted things, uh, maybe a little bit differently than what we saw with Edwards and Whitfield. Uh, Daniel Marshall, who was Stern's brother-in-law, uh, also became involved and promoted Baptist ideas in spite of the fact that the Anglicans of Virginia uh, and uh, down through the Carolinas were uh, not happy about it. They persecuted him. Uh, the Baptists were despised by the Anglicans for their um, emotional excesses. The uh, Anglicans thought there was too much emotion going on in the Baptist meetings. And uh, also the lack of training, because the Baptists didn't usually require a person to have education in order to be a pastor. The importance of the Baptist faith. Ready for Methodist yet? Um, is that there was huge Baptist growth. In 1740, there were six Baptist churches in the South. In 1790, there were 410. Of the 65,233 Baptists in America in 1790, 35,000, over 35,000 of them were in the South. So the Baptist exploded in the South. They, they, they grew tremendously. Uh, and then the Baptists really opened the way for the Methodists to come in. Uh, and the Baptists provided the religious leadership for the frontier. Okay, let's look at the Methodists now. Oh, by the way, I should ask that. Um, how many of you are a Baptist? So maybe you have a little resonation with uh, that movement. Okay, how many are Methodists? No Methodists, okay. Uh, and among the Methodists, a guy by the name of Devereux Jarrett, uh, who died in 1801, uh, was a converted <coughs> Presbyterian who became an Anglican pastor in Dinwiddle County, Virginia, uh, stressing evangelism. In 1772, again, close to the time when the War for Independence takes place, a revival swept his parish, and it continued to the War of Independence. Uh, during the war, Two-thirds of all Methodists in America were in Jared's parish. You think about that. I mean, there were Methodists other places, but two-thirds of them were under his leadership. And his way, his uh, leadership paved the way for Methodism gaining a hold in uh, America, uh, which aided uh, Wesley's workers as they were going out and encouraging people to join them. Um, the Methodist growth was substantial. Now some of this is tied to the Anglican churches as well because they were not separated quite yet, but uh, the Methodists, uh, it appeared that in 1774 there were 291 members, uh, two circuits. A circuit was where a, a pastor would go from one church to another. He would go in a circle from one to another to another Whenever he got there, they would hold meetings where he would try to get there on Sundays. Uh, but he had a, a number of churches. So one pastor could pastor a number of churches. Uh, the Methodist Church today is still doing that somewhat. You will go through small towns. Uh, you might see that there's a small Methodist church in this town, a small Methodist church in that town. And the name of the pastor is the same in both. They're still doing that. In 1775, they grew to 935 with three circuits. The next year, one, uh, 1776, Six, over 1,600 members with five circuits. In 1777, one year later, 
over 4,000 members with seven circuits. So tremendous growth among the Methodists in the South during this awakening. Now, an addendum to this is the life of Francis Asbury. In 1771, Francis Asbury volunteered to be a missionary to America. He was persecuted during the war because he was English and fled to Delaware for 20 months. In 1784, Wesley ordained Thomas Coke, sending him to America as joint superintendent with Asbury. And if you visit any Methodist places, churches, publishing houses, uh, colleges, you'll find Coke and Asbury on uh, honoring a lot of those. Uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church was formed um, in uh, Christmas time, 1784, in Baltimore. Uh, Coke ordained Asbury as a co-equal, but Asbury used the title of bishop, even though Wesley didn't want him to. Um, Asbury is considered the first American Methodist bishop and remains so until his death. So Asbury is an important person uh, in organizing the Methodists. All right, do you have any questions about the progress of the awakening in the South? and the denominations that grew up from that. Stephen. Is there a college after Francis Asbury? Yeah, Asbury College, Asbury Seminary down in Kentucky. Yeah, okay, so I think my grandma went there or something. Maybe it was my grandpa, actually. I think it was my grandpa. Maybe no one. Yeah, maybe. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so that's why if you've ever traveled down south, you'll see a lot of Baptist churches and a lot of Methodist churches, uh, especially Baptists. When I lived in uh, Dallas, there were uh, Baptist churches all over the place. Almost every block seemed to have a Baptist church, some big, some small. Some churches called Southern Baptists. And, and, and then eventually, we'll get to where the uh, Southern Baptist Convention comes into existence and breaking away from the American Baptist Church, which was the whole country, over the issue of slavery. But through it all, the Southern Baptist Church remained conservative for the most part, and the Northern Baptist Church became more and more liberal, as is true of most denominations in the North. But we'll get to that when we get closer to the 19th century. Any other questions? Uh, for tomorrow, I want you to do the content questions on page 83. Now, on number three, take note of this. Uh, the way the question is worded is not quite accurate. I want you to put the things that they opposed. Put the, the things that they opposed. And in number four, make sure you list four elements. Any questions? All right. Thank you.